It'll be fine. Oh, Jake, you look wonderful. Thank you. You can tell I'm like trying to, to assess that. You have pants on? I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. It didn't take long to get into uh, informalities. <laughs> I mean, that's an important question. Yeah, Jake. Hello. Good morning, Jake. Hey. Morning. Good to see you. Likewise. Right. Good to see everyone. All right. Good morning, everyone. Matt Braden here from the G Park team. Hope everyone's nice and warm on this lovely 16 degree Friday morning. I'm going to ask everybody to just keep themselves on mute unless they have a talking part when we get, get to the various talking parts. A um, few formalities that we're going to take care of um, on the front end of things like swearing in Jake Markovitz, a um, couple of thank yous, and then we're gonna to get to our featured speaker, Mara Neal, which uh, she's tuning in from nice balmy Atlanta, Georgia this morning. So um, on behalf of the GPAR team, Gina Rowley, Donna LaPera, Melody Zimmerman, Cheryl Adams, and myself, Matt Braden, uh, the professional staff, we welcome you to our installation of our leadership team for 2022. Um, we're so happy to have all of you here with us today. It's a special day. It's a great day. And also it's a day of gratitude and thanks um, for the folks that have helped us out with um, our board of directors from 2021. Um, some great people that um, helped us out along the way who won't be with us on the board for this upcoming year. Um, so it's important for us to go ahead and say some thank yous to, to those folks who won't be on the board in uh, the upcoming year. So Jeannie Whipple, Janice Benstock, Stephen Stiles, um, Link Slipikoff, uh, treasurer for a few years, and past president Chris Summers. We thank all five of you for the time that you generously gave to us, your energy, your thoughts, your professionalism um, in helping to guide our organization going forward. We know you're not going away. You're still involved in the association. So um, while you're not going to be serving on the board, we still have you involved in other capacities and we're very grateful for that continued relationship. So um, let's just give a round of applause to those five folks. Thank you for everything that you gave to, to us in, in the past with 2021. Since we're saying thank you to um, those in 2021, it's important to go back to 2020 and when Stephanie Biello uh, was our president, coming in and had her swearing in. And that was before we knew anything about a pandemic and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the pandemic happens and it shifted things around a little bit for us. And Stephanie um, was the right leader at the right time for us. And she was that in, in a couple of different ways. Um, not only did she serve that year, but she stayed on for an additional year, um, which obviously takes out of her, her business, her private time, um, but it was really um, her helping us out and helping out our association. And so I'm not sure if anyone watches Ted Lasso, but uh, I'm a big fan of Ted Lasso. Um, great show, it's lots of laughs, very deep and insightful stuff. Lots of things about leadership. And on his wall in his office, he has John Wooden, who is like the all time GOAT college basketball coach. He has his pyramid of success hanging on the wall. And if you're not familiar, Pyramid of Success has about 15 or so blocks. They're simple words. And Wooden, uh, John Wooden has written, written many books and whatnot, but he explains what these blocks mean. And so I'm going to use his words to identify two of the blocks that I think are most applicable to Stephanie Biello. And the first one is intentness. And I'm just going to read his words. This personal quality may be as important as any within the pyramid. It's the ability to stay the course, 
even when that course is most difficult and the obstacles seem insurmountable. You do not quit. Intentness. Be persistent. Be determined. Be tenacious. Be unrelenting. The road to achievement is rocky, hard, and long. Things easily achieved are rarely long-lasting or significant. If you have intentness and your ability warrants it, warrants it, you will eventually reach the top of the pyramid. Clearly, the last two years have been rocky. They have been unpredictable, but Stephanie certainly was persistent. She was determined. And all those things that John Wooden explained in that one particular block is personified with Stephanie and her intentness. The second block that I wanna to refer to, and that's along the bottom row, and that's loyalty. So I'm gonna read his words again. Loyalty is part of the higher nature and is also part of the nature of leaders who achieve higher goals. The power of loyalty is the reason I placed it in the center of the pyramid's foundation. A leader who has loyalty is the leader whose team I wish to be a part of. This is true almost everywhere. Most people, the overwhelming majority of us, wish to be in an organization or part of a team whose leadership cares about them, provides fairness, respect, dignity, and consideration. Loyalty from the top inspires loyalty from below. It is a most precious and powerful commodity, and it starts with a leader. We cannot thank Stephanie enough for her loyalty to GPAR, to its members, to the board, to the staff, all these different layers that involve being a president. Stephanie was loyal to all of you every single step of the way, and we are better for it. So Stephanie, I want to thank you for your loyalty, your friendship, and everything you gave to GPAR over these last two years. I know you're not going away. We're not going to let you go away. We don't give up that easily uh, when we have a diamond here. So with that, let's give a round of applause to Stephanie Biello. Where are you at, Stephanie? I'm here. Thank you so much. That was unexpected and very touching. Thank you. Um, just real quick, I wanted to personally thank all of you for your continued support, and it has been a pleasure being the president these past years. Seriously, it has. Um, I remember going into our first year thinking it would be a quiet year. We could focus on membership, outreach, and advocacy, and then COVID hit. So some of the words or feelings that came to mind that time were shock, fear, advocacy, dedication, determination, fortitude, tenacity, and care. We had a lot of leaders, a lot of members who rose to the occasion by sharing their challenges and successes and helped all of our members adapt to the change and shifted their businesses to a new platform and encouraged us all to stay strong. Some of those leaders are here today as our new uh, board, of, board of directors, uh, committee chairs, co-chairs, um, and also committee members too. The pandemic changed our real estate forever and um, some of the ways that we, we practice, communicate and engage with our members. And our second term, my second term was to test those new techniques and it was kind of the testing ground um, in a more normal climate. And although nothing takes the place of human interaction, several virtual programs in some instances have provided our members great value in building their businesses, furthering their education and disseminating information critical to our association and our industry. GPAR has always been the voice of real estate and now we have reached a new level, laying the groundwork for associations, not only in our state, in some cases around the country, in member engagement and advocating for our members and protecting the rights of our property owners. Great things are on the horizon for our association and I highly encourage you all to stay connected to GPAR the way we have throughout this pandemic. I'm looking forward to a bright future for our association with our wonderful staff. They're amazing. We have the best staff. I'm, and I'm not just saying that, we hear it all over, all over the country, all the time. Our staff is amazing. Our committee chairs and vice chairs and our new board of directors, and of course, our new president, Jake Markovitz. It's been an honor to serve as your president, and I thank you all. I have another round of applause for Stephanie. 
Okay, so great words, and we're glad that you're not going anywhere, Stephanie. We look forward to uh, to what's in the future for all of us. Um, so let's get to swearing in some folks. So where are our incoming board of directors? And I'm going to rattle off your names really quick. So we have our directors, Emily Wang, Mark Turner, Chris Mattioli, Anastasia Dewan, Brittany Nettles, Greg Damis, Stephanie Biello is immediate past president, Roderick Walker uh, as president-elect, Carlos Masip as vice president, and Katie McGrath as treasurer. So could just wave, there we go, thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to introduce for the swearing in, four time past president of GPAR and city councilman, Alan Dom. Councilman Dom. Thank you, Matt, and welcome everybody. And this is an honor for me to be here today. And Stephanie, I wanna thank you for two years of tremendous leadership on our behalf. You, you're what I've learned in city council, Stephanie, which is do all the work and give everyone else the credit. So thank you, Stephanie, for your leadership. And I also wanna thank, he might be, uh, our, our past president of the National Association of Realtors, Charlie Opera, who served us really well this past year. And Jake, to you, congratulations, best wishes to you. Know that all of us are here to support you and help you. And I think I saw your parents on here, so congratulations to them too. That's amazing <clears throat> to have your parents uh, on this. So best of luck. I wanna mention one thing and then I'll get to the swearing in. I don't know if all of you realize that under Stephanie's leadership, under Matt's leadership and the board of directors, you all passed in city council legislation called the Wholesaler Bill that helps people who have homes in Philadelphia who are not aware of their values get the proper value for their home and not have generational wealth taken from them. And I say this because now the GPAR legislation has become a model across the country. Kansas City is looking at it and got a copy of our legislation and so did many other municipalities across the country. So I just want to congratulate GPAR on putting that forward. Stephanie and Matt, that was all you guys with CLS. Great job. And just know that this is now across the country. This is like unbelievable for Philadelphia that you set that record. It's really amazing. So <clears throat> let's get to the business at hand. To the GPAR line officers and board of directors, you're about to assume a role that will no longer classify you as a private citizen, but a public servant. You are now identified as officers and directors of the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors and committed to the best interests of the public and to the welfare of your members. In this role, you're entering a new adventure in camaraderie, friendship that comes only through service, cooperation, and sharing with others. The secret of living is the art of giving. And so to you this year comes the privilege of giving and learning that lasting happiness comes through the investment of your time and your unselfish interest in the lives of others. And before I just mention the oath of office, I really have GPAR to thank for where I am today. I would not be in city council if it wasn't for GPAR. GPAR is the reason why I'm in city council. So it's kind of amazing what you, when you realize what the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors has accomplished. The oath of office, to those now being installed, please raise your right hand. Let's see those right hands, okay. You do solemnly and sincerely promise and swear that you will administer the role as either officers or directors to the best of your ability and judgment in conformity with the constitution and bylaws of greater, the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors, the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors, and the National Association of Realtors. That you will adhere to and enforce the code of ethics of the Realtor Code, that you will uphold and enforce the provisions of the Pennsylvania licensing law and the rules and regulations of the State Real Estate Commission, that you will in all your acts be governed by the principles of honesty, justice and fair play and in every manner possible endeavor to promote and safeguard the best interests of the citizens of our commonwealth, the high purposes of GPAR and the welfare of its membership. So I'm gonna ask you to please subscribe and answer by saying I do. All those, please answer. Raise I your do. hand. I do. I, I do. do. I 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 think I do. Got I think we got everybody. Matt, you take a little roll count there. You may lower your hand. By virtue of the authority conferred upon me by the National Association of Realtors, I do hereby proclaim each of you as officially installed officers and directors 
of the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, congratulations. Thank you, Councilman Dom, for helping us out with the oath right there. Congratulations to our 2022 Board of Directors and line officers. Uh, we really look forward to working together with you um, in the coming year. Lots of great stuff ahead of us. Um, and again, thank you, Councilman Dom, for your leadership and helping out with getting that piece of legislation passed. Uh, Katie McGrath, who's our incoming, um, our, now our treasurer, uh, lots of thanks to her for really being a, a catalyst and a driver behind um, making that th those initial conversations happen on the wholesaling legislation. Um, sometimes you have to someone uh, poke you and she was the poker and she did a great job with that. So thank you, Katie, um, getting us all to, to move, move that thing along and to be a national example. So let's shift to uh, Jake Markovitz here. So this is where we start the roast, Jake. Um, I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding. All right, where's Butter? There we go. All right, so we have Louise Butter D'Alessandro, 1997 president of GPAR, um, great influencer. Uh, when I first was on the job, one of the first calls I got was from Butter and she said, I don't know who you are, but we're gonna go have lunch. And so we had lunch and um, she's a great voice and we're so lucky to have her in our leadership um, here with GPAR, you know, in, in mysterious ways and how she kind of works, works her thing. And there we go, Jake, Jake's got the assistant uh, right there in the camera, check that out, looking good. All right, so Butter, the floor is yours. Thanks guys, and it's an honor, Jacob, to do this. I've known you for so many years and um, it's just delightful that you're here and that you've taken on this responsibility and I wanted to congratulate Sam and Michael and Kaylin and this beautiful baby boy Jacob want to introduce him please I, I needed some help holding my my right hand up this morning so this is Elijah hi Elijah muffled Elijah so this is just a very very special time and I'm sorry we're doing this on zoom but at the same time I'm delighted we're doing it on zoom because I think we have people here that we wouldn't have otherwise. So welcome everybody. And as Alan said, um, I think that um, I've been a successful realtor because of GPAR. When I started in the business, I started volunteering in 1979 and met some of the strongest business people in Philadelphia. Continue to work behind the scenes a little bit with GPAR and um, will as long as I can sell real estate. So sorry about that. I should have turned that off. Um, and Kaylin, um, Jacob, Elijah's mommy and Jacob's wife is here. Hi, Kaylin. Thank you all for being here and I'll get this going. And hi, and Katie, congratulations too. And all past presidents and just as amazing morning. Thank you. So here we go, Jake. Jake, you are about to assume a role that would no longer classify you as a private citizen but a public servant. You are now identified as an officer of the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors and committed to the best interests of the public and to the welfare of your members. As president, you are entering a new adventure in camaraderie and friendship that comes only through service, cooperation, and sharing with others. The secret of living is the art of giving, and so do you this year comes the privilege of giving and learning that lasting happiness comes through the investment of your time and your unselfish interest in the lives of others. Jake, will you please raise your right hand? You do solemnly and sincerely promise and swear that you will administer the role of president to the best of your ability and judgment in conformity with the constitution and bylaws of the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors, the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors, and the National Association of Realtors. That you will adhere to, the, to and enforce the code of ethics of the realtor, that you will uphold and enforce the provisions of the Pennsylvania licensing law and the rules and regulations of the State Real Estate Commission, that you will in all your acts be governed by the principle of honesty, justice, and fair play, and in every manner possible endeavor to promote and safeguard the best interests of the citizens of our Commonwealth, the high purposes of GPAR, and the welfare of its members. Do you subscribe? Please answer. 
I do. You may lower your hand. <laughs> Elijah's looking at that. By virtue of the authority conferred upon me by the National Association of Realtors, I do hereby proclaim you as officially installed president of the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors. Congratulations, Jacob. There you go. Thank you, Butter. It's, it's official. It's official. Now the, now the fun begins. Congratulations, Jake. Thank you, Matt. Jake has a few remarks that he wants to share with all of us. So, Jake, the floor is 100% yours. That baby's heavy. Um, all right. Uh, thank you all for being here today. I, I am greatly honored for this uh, privilege, and I am I'm looking forward to this year. Um, as I've shared the news of becoming president with family and friends, I'm often asked, is that a big deal? And I'm always a little unsure how to answer. Am I a big deal? I like to think so, but probably not. Uh, is GPAR a big deal? Absolutely. GPAR has over 3,600 members locally, and the National Association of Realtors is America's largest trade association. NAR is one of the, NAR is one of the most powerful political lobbies in the country. At the local and state level, uh, GPAR plays a major role in steering housing policy and protecting property rights. And GPAR is responsible for maintaining and enforcing professional standards and the code of ethics for our members. It is our code of ethics that sets realtors apart, but the code of ethics also has a complicated history. In 1924, it was our code of ethics that helped codify segregation in national housing policy. Realtors block busted and flamed white flight. They turned a blind eye to redlining. 1974, 50 years later, and six years after the Civil Rights Act enacted fair housing laws, which NAR opposed, realtors finally got proactive in being anti-discriminatory based on race. 2014, 40 years later, the code changed to include the LGBTQ community. 2019, Newsday exposes wild discriminatory realtor practices on, in Long Island the New York State Association of Realtors is taking serious and overdue action in response. And until last year, the code of ethics allowed realtors to be racist and discriminatory in their daily lives, as long as they didn't do it while showing someone a house. Many of us here strive to be better and do the right thing at all times, but we are living in an unprecedented time of incredible division. We live in a city with extreme poverty and extreme wealth. Philadelphia has the highest poverty rate of all major cities. We live in a city that has been greatly impacted by segregation. And while much of this is not our fault, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to do what we can. I have no idea how you fix poverty and social and racial injustice. I do believe increasing home ownership and developing affordable housing is a good place to start. And understanding the problem and its roots is key to fixing the problem. One of my first goals as president is to get as many of our members as possible to read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. The book presents a stark look at how our government, through housing policy, FHA, VA, banking regulation, public housing, was deliberately responsible for segregation and the impact it has had on our communities. Realtors helped and benefited the whole time. It's a heavy read, both in its content and its emotional soul. It's sad and terrifying and infuriating. I had to set the book down several times and walk away. Everyone on GPAR's board and committees is receiving a copy from me. And I'm happy to provide a copy to anyone on this call if you promise to pass it forward to another realtor after you read it. We are planning programming around the book for later this year. It's easy to pretend this was a practice by a few bad apples a long time ago, the kind of thing we learn about in history books but understanding how prevalent and systemic these practices were and still are and the longstanding impact they've had in our communities is imperative to fixing them. At the end of the day, we help people achieve the American dream. We help people find and provide shelter and, and build the foundation for intergenerational wealth for their families. We have much to be proud of and the ship is headed in the right direction. In 2020, NAR President Charlie Opler offered an, emo an emotional apology on behalf of the industry 
for NAR's actions during a large part of the 20th century. In his apology, Oppler said, what realers did was an outrage to our morals and our ideals. It was a betrayal to our commitment to fairness and equality. I'm here today to say that we were wrong. We can't go back to fix the mistakes of the past, but we can look this problem squarely in the eye. And on behalf of our industry, we can say that what realtors did was shameful and we are sorry. I believe in everything Oppler said, and now it is our responsibility to make sure that this apology carries meaningful action and a lasting impact behind it. I challenge us as members to change the game. Let's increase the rate of black home ownership in Philadelphia. Let's increase the rate of minority realtors in our industry. Let's continue the work of limiting wholesalers' ability to take advantage of families. Let's broaden our efforts to identify bad actors in our industry and hold them accountable. Let's work with unlikely stakeholders in the city to improve Philadelphia for all Philadelphians. I wanna take a moment to thank everyone who has been part of this opportunity for me and our success at GPAR. Our CEO, Matt Braden and staff, Donna, Cheryl, Gina and Melody make so much of what we do a reality. We all owe a deep gratitude and appreciation to the staff for their tireless work. To Heather Patron, this is all your fault. I mean, thank you for pushing me to get involved. To Stephanie, the board, the nominating committee, committee leaders, co-chairs, and members, thank you for your support and your contribution to GPAR. At the end of the day, we are a volunteer-based organization and we are nothing without our members. To everyone at Elephant Wissick and Realtors and the Carrie Gavin Group, there are just so many names to name. Butter, Paul, Bob, Katie, Carrie, Asher, and I. I could keep going. I wouldn't be here without you. And finally, to my family, Sam, I mean, mom, the best conveyancer in Philadelphia, and dad, I never made it to law school, but this is pretty cool. I wouldn't be the person I am without you. And to Kaylin and Elijah, I love you, and I'm so grateful for your support. I couldn't do this without you. In closing, here's a fun fact. I listened to a lot of hip hop growing up. I still do. And as I've been thinking a lot about this speech and GPAR and what we do, one lyric has stayed with me. Make money, don't let the money make you. Change the game, don't let the game change you. Make money, don't let the money make you. Change the game, don't let the game change you. Let's change the game. Thank you. Congratulations, Sheikh. Great words. Thank you very much for that. Um, when you sent me the preview of your speech, uh, we reached out to 2021 NAR President Charlie Oppler and he immediately said, I'll be there, I'll jump on. Um, because that message that you're delivering is so powerful because I, I, I took the indulgence and I shared this, the remarks with him. And he immediately said, I'm all in. Unfortunately, he's down in Florida with his dad right now. Um, his mom passed away last week. He got his schedule screwed up. So he's texting me. He just tried to FaceTime. So he sends his best wishes to you, Jake. I'm sorry that uh, he wasn't able to be here with you today. Um, but he's got your back. And anything that you need to advance that, he's all in. And um, he's going to be helping us out with the mentorship program. So it's pretty cool that. Uh, your words resonated with him in, in a powerful way, just like his words did with you. Um, you. With that, we have someone else that wants to share some congratulations with you, Jake. And uh, if anyone doesn't know this, um, Jake is a big time Phillies fan. So um, the voice of the Phillies, Tom McCarthy, want to go ahead and wish some words to Jake. So here we go. Hey, Jake, it's Tom McCarthy from the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, congratulations on becoming the president of GPAR. Uh, not only are you a great real estate agent, but you're also going to be a great man in the community as well. Uh, that is awesome. I uh, hope everything's going great for you. Uh, hopefully the 2022 season uh, will give the Phils a little real estate in the postseason. I think we're all hoping for that. We're all hoping just to get down to spring training and get things rocking and rolling as well. Uh, but we appreciate uh, your fandom. Appreciate your support of the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, so I've thrown axes before. 
I don't do it well. I understand you do it pretty well. That is awesome. Anyway, congratulations from all of your friends at GPAR. And uh, hopefully it's a great 2022, not only for you, but also for your organization as well. Go Phils. <laughs> all right. There we go. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. So Jake had a big time request here that he wanted to go ahead and have this, not just as a formal thing, but also to have a, a opportunity to go ahead and learn something. Um, so we have our featured speaker, Mara Neal with us from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, like we talked about earlier. Mara, we're sorry. We went a little bit over with all the, all the, uh, the work that we had to do here with swearing in our board and whatnot, but where is Mara Neal? She's someplace I'm, out there. I'm here. Hello. <laughs> there we go. So um, everybody has seen the introduction of, of Mara with our with our emails that we have sent out to everybody. But just really quick, she's a national speaker. She's well respected. She's a top producer, um, RPAC Hall of Famer, a runner. She goes all over the place. She is a voice that has a lot of weight and is respected. And she knows the life that you guys live with trying to make a living via real estate. And so she has a lot of wisdom and nuggets to go ahead and share with all of you. So our goal here today is to grab a few nuggets so that you can make 2022 successful um, and beyond. So Mara, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. I'm, oh, it says uh, screen sharing is disabled. Can you enable that so I can pull the PowerPoint? Okay, perfect. There. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So let me just pull this up real quick but while I'm doing that. Um, congratulations, Jake. And um, I really enjoyed listening to your speech. And I have my handy copy of The Color of Law here. For those of you that are getting this as a gift from Jake, you're, you're in for a wild read. It's it's uplifting and it's infuriating all at once, like Jake said, and um, it's definitely eye-opening. Uh, so I'm excited that he's providing that for you. And really quickly, uh, before we get started, it's I love coming on to, to calls like this um, and not only being able to celebrate a, a new leader, but also there are people on this call that have been inspirational to me. There's two people, uh, Bill Lublin and Alan Dom, who are personally responsible for the fact that I not only um, uh, own one rental property, but have built a portfolio over the years. Bill started encouraging me um, in his unique Bill way to just to just do it. Just stop thinking about it and just do it if it feels right. And then I sat in a bar with Alan one evening on uh, when we met at an NAR conference, and he wrote on a napkin and made me sign it that I would buy one investment property a year for the next 10 years. Um, I haven't quite made that goal, but I've got five now. And um, I'll tell you, the realtor family and, and what we get out of our relationships when we meet people in our own market and from all around the country, that's not not only adds to the richness of our realtor experience, but also to our uh, actual riches. Uh, so celebrate your association, get involved if you're not already, and um, take advantage of all of those nuggets and all of that wisdom that you can not only get from others, but also your own that you can share. So when Matt and Jake reached out to me and they asked me to um, talk to you this morning, we had a little bit of a different plan and we switched gears this week. Uh, I keynoted a similar event yesterday for a local association here in Atlanta. And I reached out to Jake and I said, you know, I think this might be a better topic as we are uh, starting the year and with a little bit of uncertainty uh, for the third year in a row, um, having to deal with complications of a pandemic, what that means for us in our in our personal lives, in our events such as this one, and also in our businesses, and just just the uncertainty of of what the year looks like with our low inventory issues and all of the things that go into um, getting back to normal. So I wanted to talk a little bit this morning about um, resolutions and goal setting and failures and try to maybe reshape the way that you think about those things as we head into 2022. 
So the new year, new you marketing message has been a popular one for about the last decade or so. Personally, I don't really like it. It makes me think to myself, well, what's wrong, what's wrong with this me? How difficult is it going to be to create a whole new you? Uh, are there things that, I, that I'm not seeing that are wrong about myself that I need to change? If you're anything like me, you look in the mirror and you can catalog all the things that you think are wrong with yourself or that you would like to change. Um, but then when you see a marketing campaign that tells you maybe you can be a whole new you, that makes me think there's a whole slew of other things that might be wrong with me that they see that I don't. In fact, recent studies suggest that the new year, new you mentality is actually closely associated with certain mental health issues. And of course, these marketing messages only come about right around the new year when we're all thinking about our new year's resolutions. So if you're like me, you have at some point in your life made a new year's resolution or two. And if you're like me, at some point you have probably failed. In fact, Chances are, and statistics show, that you've probably failed more of your New Year's resolutions than succeeded. And there's a reason for that. There's definitely things that are wrong with the idea of a New Year's resolution. First of all, they rarely set us up for success, mainly because they're often vague with things like lose weight or save money or drink more water. Well, how much weight? How much water? How much money do I need to save? And how am I going to do it? They're often extreme, I'm gonna go vegan, or they are just unstructured and they don't have a plan. Secondly, they often focus on imagined imperfections. We live in this culture now, especially thanks to social media that celebrates impossible perfection. We look at well curated social media feeds, people's Instagram where they've taken 500 photos just to get that one perfect one. We use filters to take out our wrinkles. Uh, you can even Photoshop yourself to remove cellulite to make your waistline thinner. And of course we look at the marketing messages in magazines and on television and we're faced with an idea of impossible, unobtainable perfection. And also the fact that not everything that people post online is true. I know it's hard to believe, but when I look at the social media feed of a realtor colleague of mine who regularly posts, did it again, another million dollar home under contract. And then I see them post their final sales numbers at the end of the year. It very, very literally doesn't add up. So what we see online makes us look at ourselves and be more self-critical in ways that we really shouldn't and in ways that we never would have before the idea of social media culture. And finally, of course, oh, come on, go forward. Oops, sorry, my slides are being a little temperamental. The definition of resolution in and of itself doesn't leave room for one very important piece. And it's an all, ingredient, all important ingredient for success, and that is failure. The definition of resolution makes us think that it's a firm decision to do or not do something. In other words, it's binary. You're either going to succeed or you're going to fail. And no room for failure means no room for growth, no room for learning, or even to acknowledge progress that we've made along the way. So if we can't even celebrate our small victories, on the journey to our final destination, which is, is achieving that success, achieving the resolution, then really we don't allow ourselves any room for growth, progress, learning, and ultimately what we end up with is failure. Uh, so let's look at gym memberships for a minute because these are an easy target, right? This is something that it's easy to talk about when we talk about New Year's resolutions. It's the one that most people think of when we think of making a resolution. And just looking at the statistics is disturbing. 12% of all new gym memberships happen in January. So of course it's December. We are uh, overindulging both uh, in spending, in free time, in food and drink. We're very literally overspending. Uh, and we sign up for that new gym membership and often at a discount, but that discount comes with a price. It either comes with a long contract or it comes with an auto billing that they know we're going to set it and forget it. But 80% won't make it past the five month mark. And more than half never even go regularly. 
So we don't even make it through the first month of going to the gym regularly. The gym that we've signed up for, we've put it on auto bill. Maybe we've paid in advance for a certain number of months to get that coveted discount so that we feel like we're saving even though we're spending. And the majority continue to pay through a longer contract or through the set it and forget it mentality of auto billing. And do we reach the goal? No, because we sign up in a tipsy moment with uh, scribbling it on a napkin on New Year's Eve or toasting friends and agreeing to hold each other accountable. So if the new year, new you mentality isn't the best way to go, if resolutions are vague and they lack intention and purpose, then what do we do? I was listening to an episode of the Tim Ferriss podcast the other day, and Tim interviewed a fellow fellow podcaster named Rich Roll. And he suggested that instead of setting resolutions, instead of uh, raising our glass on New Year's Eve and promising ourselves and others that we're going to do all these um, grand things for ourselves, we should think instead about transformation. We should ask ourselves, what do I want to become? And what am I becoming? Now you might say to yourself, well, becoming something else, transformation, that sounds a little bit like the new year, new you mentality, but I challenge you to think about it like this. A caterpillar morphs into a moth or a beautiful butterfly. It's still the same organism. It still has the same DNA. It has transformed. It's not a whole new you. It's just, just looks a little different, whether it's from the inside or the outside. A chameleon changes colors based on its environment. It transforms, it looks a little different, but it's still the same thing. If you think about transformation and becoming in that way, it's not the new year, new you mentality. It's small changes that we make based on ideas of self-improvement or wellness. But when we do it in a smart way, when we have a plan, in other words, replace the word resolution with goals. And when you think about goals, it makes you think a little bit differently. It's just a change in semantics, but it can inspire a new mindset. And when we set goals, for example, for our businesses, we do that with a plan. We do it with intention. But when we make resolutions, why don't we do it with the same amount of intention and, and planning? So I would urge you to think about any changes that you want to make for this year. Think about it in terms of transformation and then set a plan in motion so that you can have a specific goal that you want to reach, make it measurable, decide what those milestones are along the way, decide if it's attainable, sit and think about the time that you have to put into it, whether it's relevant to where you are in your life, in your business right now, and then put a deadline on it, make it time-based. And if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, give several tiny timelines so that you can break it down even further into more digestible pieces. Because there's the old saying that how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You can't take one big bite out of a resolution. You have to have small bites that you take along the way in order to set yourself up for success. So let's talk a little bit about how we set those SMART goals. First of all, we, um, we said we, we have to have a plan in place. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's the way that we avoid inadvertently celebrating the new January 17th holiday, which is National Ditch Your Resolutions Day. <laughs> and just by virtue of the fact that there's a national day for ditching your New Year's resolutions tells me that there's something wrong with setting resolutions. And then we remember, and it's also important to have the mindset that some goals are difficult to achieve. Um, what you, what's, what the difficulty and the struggle that is below the surface is not always what we see from the outside. Having someone there that you can talk to, maybe it's an accountability partner, maybe it's just a spouse who agrees to keep the sweets out of the pantry because they know that you both know that you have trouble avoiding them late at night when you want that sugary snack. Remembering that everyone wants to be successful, but without that roadmap to success and acknowledging that there might be a degree of difficulty along the way, we're setting ourselves up to have less success than we might otherwise. So we need our goals to be specific. We need to answer questions like, what are they? Why is it important? 
acknowledging that there's a reason that the goal is important to you and that it's personal to you will make you more likely to stick with it. Maybe you need to ask someone for help, whether it's a spouse or that accountability partner. Maybe it's your business partner or just a friend that you can confide in and trust with your goal. You need to decide if it's going to take you somewhere else. If it means going to the gym, for example, do you have time in your schedule? Carve it out, put it on your calendar. And do you have resources that you'll need to tap into or will you face any personal limitations? Make sure that it's measurable. How much is it going to cost you, whether that's money or time or energy? And how will you know when it's accomplished? You need to know when it's okay to celebrate. And that means setting those milestones and making sure that those are measurable as well. Making sure that it's attainable, that you've prioritized. If you have more than one goal, what's the most important one? You might need to sacrifice some of them, some of the lesser ones along the way. You need to know that you've set that plan in motion. And is it realistic with your current uh, work and personal commitments? Are there time constraints or financial constraints that you need to consider? Is it relevant to where you are in your life right now, where you are in your business right now? And of course, setting that target date <coughs> and that deadline to make sure that you can see when it's time to celebrate and, and to bring others in on that celebration as well. So to recap, we need to set a goal, make a plan, get to work on it and stick to it. And then of course, be ready to celebrate when you hit that final destination. But with any goal, I think it's important to talk about failure. And I don't think of failure as being a bad word. In fact, it's my second favorite F word. Uh, and I think that it's important to acknowledge that there are some pretty famous failures in history and that without their, them learning from their failures and sticking to it, we might not have things um, that we're used to having in our lives right now. For example, I think that uh, it, we need to acknowledge that Thomas Edison had thousands of failed pro prototypes for the electric light. And yet here I am with a ring light in front of me, electric light overhead. Uh, we, we have something that we very much take for granted today because of those failures. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs had countless failures early on in their careers. Bill Gates' first company failed. And of course, Babe Ruth had over 1300 strikeouts but that's not what we remember him for. We remember him for his 714 home runs. And if I got that number wrong, don't, don't ding me in the chat box. <laughs> um, I think if we, if we uh, reset our ideas about failure and we, we acknowledge that we are going to hit some roadblo roadblocks along the way, there are going to be some speed bumps. There are going to be things that we need to acknowledge maybe hold us back. But I want to also point out that I don't think that the opposite of failure is success. Let's not think about them in terms of the binary. In other words, uh, we have to reframe our mindset about, about whether there's just one or the other. Is it just success or failure? They're not mutually exclusive. We can achieve great success even with multiple failures along the way. Unfortunately, we've been conditioned to think of failure as being the antithesis of success. But think about it this way. Uh, uh, if, if you, if you, it, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> if you fail at something and that is the end for you, then you've created the opposite of success. But if you get up and you keep going, you might find that there's greater success for you all along the way. Think about it in terms of resilience. The opposite of failure is resilience. It's whether or not we have the stick to itiveness to keep going. And if we do, then we can achieve even greater success than we maybe originally thought possible. And recognizing that failure is not the enemy of success, but rather its friend, its cohort, its partner in crime, the thing that makes you achieve even greater possibility than you thought, makes me think about the, uh, a theory from 2018 and a book by the same name that's called Factfulness. Now, the original study and the original uh, theory of factfulness, factfulness was brought about 
from a study that was done on the effect of our news media on our mental health. Now think about that for a minute. In 2018, they were studying the effect of our news media on our mental health. So that's a pretty mind blowing study in and of itself. But what it, what it was looking at was those who consumed their news from only one uh, news outlet versus those who consumed news from a variety of news outlets. In other words, people who are getting just one side of the story or just one bias and people who are looking at the story from many different angles and coming up with their own opinions. And what they decided was the focus on long-term progress is actually a source of mental peace. Looking at a story from many different angles gave those participants more sense of mental peace than it did from those who only looked at it from one angle. They were more able to celebrate uh, success stories and progress of our country because they were getting many different opinions about a news story and coming up with their own. And then they decided that this actually is more about how we consume news and how we consume uh, things from the national media. It's really more about how we consume our own life experiences. And they determined that it's unhealthy to not recognize progress. Otherwise, the consequent loss of hope can be devastating. So if we don't if we don't reach a goal, for example, a weight loss goal, if your goal is to lose 50 pounds, but by the end of the term that you've been working on, you've only lost 20, not celebrating the loss of that 20 makes you feel like a failure because you didn't hit 50. But what if you celebrate that 20 pounds and you say, well, it's going to take me a little bit longer than I thought, but I'm going to celebrate the fact that I have made progress. That's much healthier, I think we can agree, for our mental health. And when we look at it in terms of resilience, if, you, if your goal is to run a half marathon, and by the time that half marathon comes around, all you can run is a, is a 5K, celebrate that 5K. Maybe your progress is a little slower than you thought it was going to be, but at the end of the day, you still have something to celebrate. So the factfulness theory is that we need to look at the facts of our progress along the journey rather than just whether or not we got to the destination on time. And I wanna talk really quickly about quitting versus giving up, giving up. Semantics again, I know, but unfortunately we've been enculturated to believe that quitting is bad. They're saying things like, oh, she's such a quitter or winners never quit and quitters never win. But I think there's a, a real difference in, in quitting versus giving up. And I think we need to look at quitting from a positive perspective because sometimes we need to quit. I think about my friend who qualified several years ago to run the Boston Marathon. She's been a lifelong distance runner. And any of you who know anything about running know that the Boston Marathon is arguably the most difficult race to qualify for. Based on age group, uh, the average qualifying time to run 26.2 miles is four hours and 10 minutes. And I will tell you right now, having completed one marathon in my life, that's more than two hours quicker then I can run <laughs> any marathon for probably more like three hours quicker. And it's capped at 30,000 runners. So even if you qualify with a wicked fast time and you make the qualifying time frame for your age group, still only one in five applicants is accepted. And those are pretty devastating numbers in and of themselves. But she qualified. She had tried for several years. She finally had a qualifying time. She had applied for several years with a qualifying time and she finally got a bib. Around mile 11, things started to go wrong. She started to not feel right. Around mile 15, she was in pretty bad pain. And just before she hit mile 17, she had to quit. And she was embarrassed about it. I remember reading her Facebook post, thanking all of the people and her friends and uh, her family who had supported her and apologizing for not finishing, apologizing for having to quit. And that was heartbreaking for me. First of all, I knew how devastated she was, but second of all, she did something that most of us will never do. Most of us will never even get that qualifying time, let alone get accepted. And she felt bad about herself for quitting, but quitting because her body told her, please don't do this to us, please don't go on. So it might be semantics, but I think there's a strong difference between quitting and giving in, and we need to give ourselves permission sometimes to be a quitter. Think about it this way. 
the kid who quits a sport because it no longer brings her joy versus the kid who gives up because everyone's better than me. If a student realizes that the, the major they've chosen for themselves in college isn't their passion any longer, and they quit that major to move on to something else that interests them more, that's different than just giving up because you failed a test or you failed a class. The real estate agent who does a marketing initiative for several months diligently, they've budgeted for it, they review it every month, it's just not bringing the return on investment, so they quit versus the real estate agent who sends one just, just listed postcard and gives up completely on geographic farming because it just doesn't work. So there's a difference. We need to give ourselves permission to quit when quitting feels right. Quitting is not giving up, it's not giving in. And sometimes our resolutions or our goals end up being something that we just aren't interested in completing. And we shouldn't let that self guilt uh, or the fact that we told others that it was a goal keep us from, from removing that from our list of priorities. And lastly, I want to go back to the idea of transformation, because I think that in, in any talk of success, we need to reset our personal barometer um, and consider uh, the transformation and the becoming of the journey as an important role in getting to that destination. So many of you who know me, uh, and I saw so many familiar faces um, as I was scrolling through the participants on the call, you might know that I have a little bit of a love for baking. What I love about baking is that it is both a science and an art. So the science is what creates the food and makes it edible, right? It's what makes the, the yeast rise and it makes the pastry puff into those beautiful buttery layers. The art is about making it look pretty. It's the beautifully decorated cake once it's risen and baked in the oven. It's those um, sourdough artists that emerged and exploded onto Instagram and Facebook during the pandemic and during lockdown that create these intricately decorated sourdough breads that I, I can't even begin to understand how they do it. The science is the necessary part. It's the part that makes it edible and it makes it taste good. The art is completely secondary. It's, it's totally unnecessary. It's just the, the nice little thing that uh, for the ego, for the pat on the back, like look at this beautiful cake I made and it, it tastes good, but isn't it pretty too? There's a phenomenon in cooking uh, called the Maillard effect or the Maillard reaction. And it's a chemical reaction that happens between amino acids and sugars as the sugars reduce. And that's what transforms what we eat into something amazing. It puts the sear on a steak or it's what car caramelizes onions, right? Um, but in baking, it's the thing that makes the outside of the bread crusty and the inside stays soft and, and um, chewy and makes it just that, it makes it sing in your mouth. It's what, when you sprinkle that granulated sugar on a pie crust, or if you don't bake it and you go and you buy it at the store, it gives it that lovely sugary crunch. It doesn't taste like you're just eating a spoonful of sugar, but it adds a flavor profile to that crust that makes it even better. It's what happens when we roast coffee beans. Uh, if you've ever tasted a coffee bean on its own before it's been roasted, uh, it's pretty disgusting. It's kind of like tasting an olive off the tree before it's been brined. But once they roast it, it takes on the flavor of what we love to drink in the morning. Or it's what happens when we roast marshmallows out uh, over a bonfire or even over our, our gas burner on our stove when we're just craving that one amazing s'more. Uh, it's, it's that Maillard effect that's the transformation. So I want you to think about the fact that as you set your goals for the year, whether it's your business goals or your personal goals, it's about the science, not the art. It might not look pretty to get there. Uh, your journey may not be one that you want uh, to publicize on Facebook. You might not want to post sweaty photos of yourself at the gym. Um, I know some people really love that. Some people look great when they go to the gym. That's not me. Um, so the, the journey may not be pretty. It may not be like the art of baking, but the, if the science is there, if you're following your plan, then uh, you can celebrate the transformation along the way and those small milestones. So just to wrap up, let's talk about some last strategies for success that I haven't already mentioned in the SMART goal setting. 
First of all, make sure you write down your goals. Write them down somewhere, jot them down on a piece of paper, put them on the whiteboard on your office, make a, make a list on your phone, whatever it is, um, jot them down and then share them with someone that you trust. Um, whether that's a spouse, a friend, an accountability partner, tell them what you need from them because they shouldn't have to guess. If you want them to check in with you every Monday morning or just every once in a while when you sit down to have coffee or a happy hour for them to just bring it up and say, hey, how's that goal going? How's it going for you? Um, uh, track your progress. And this means both the successes and the failures. Make sure that you're tracking it somewhere so that you can see those ups and downs. And that allows you to celebrate when it's more ups than downs. And those little milestones along the way, make sure you're allowing time to celebrate those as well. Visualize what it looks like for you at the end. What does success look like? Create a vision board, um, journal about it, but write down somewhere what you think the end is going to look like. Do one joy-filled activity every day. Uh, focusing on our business goals and our personal goals can feel like work sometimes more than it is um, fun. So do something for yourself every day, whether it's taking 15 minutes to, to read a book for pleasure, you know, 30 minutes alone in the quiet with your coffee in the morning before you, before you make yourself open your email or go for that run. Um, take a moment to just sit and pet your dog, whatever it is that brings you joy, turn off everything around you and do that. And then also add uh, five minutes of stillness to your day whenever you can. Sometimes I just go and sit in my closet uh, with all my electronics away from me, except my phone. I set my phone on airplane mode. I put my timer on five minutes and I just sit and enjoy the quiet. Every once in a while, we just have to turn it all off. There's so much coming at us these days with our email and our phone and our clients and notifications and just turn it all off and give yourself five minutes of complete peace. And then finally, you become what you believe. So when uh, Tim Ferriss asked Rich Ross what he, how he set his goals for the year, he says he focuses on transformation and he asks himself, what do you want to become? So think about focusing on positive self-talk, not negativity. If you do hit a speed bump or you... in you experience a failure, make yourself believe that it's okay. It's just a stumbling block. It's just something that you need to sit and wallow about for a few minutes and then pick yourself up. Remember that little flower growing out of the sidewalk? Be resilient and get back on track with your plan uh, to try again. Uh, be like Thomas Edison, be like Bill Gates, be like Babe Ruth. Um, don't let those failures uh, be the thing that stops you. Make them spur you on so that you can achieve even greater things than maybe you originally believed. And I hope that you have a great 2022. All right, Mar, thank you very much for those words of inspiration um, and for challenging us to all to think a little bit differently as we move into this new year. Uh, it's funny, just the other day, I was reading a story about the fitness tracker at Strava and how they celebrate there on January 20th, I'm sorry, January 17th is like a day in the office that they celebrate because they know that stuff starts to fall off and they see it with people and their, their workout habits and all that kind of stuff like that. So it's about the long road, it's about the long haul. Um, and that's words of inspiration for all of us, not just with how we do our work, but how we conduct our daily lives and we wanna be successful, right? Um, so lots of different nuggets there. Uh, with that, Jake, do you have any parting words for our, our folks that are here with us today? Uh, I just wanna say thank you again for everybody who's on here. Maura, thank you. Uh, Stephanie, I've, I have big shoes to fill and, and you, you know, crushed the last two years and uh, amid some very uphill sledding and uh, you know, Matt and everyone, I am, I'm looking forward to this year and I am uh, grateful to all of you. All right. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Great turnout, great to see so many past leaders of GPAR. Um, awesome, awesome representation from our past presidents here today, all these screens. Um, 
I would start to chime in with all the names, but I would probably miss somebody because there's all these screens of folks um, here. But thank you all for, for tuning in. Have a great Friday. Keep warm. And have a great weekend. And uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.